thanks for joining us. Uh, we realise that the, uh, the online services aren't quite the same as they were a few weeks ago, and we're hoping that anybody joining online, uh, presumably watching Kelly Loki, will be able to come and join us here at Zor Church in the really near future. But we've got a lot of our family uh, that are still isolating, unable to, to come out just yet. We do remember you in our prayers. You're a really important part of our family, uh, and we do hope you don't feel too disconnected. Yeah. So, um, so as we said a little earlier on, Paul of the Dewalt Smith is meant to be bringing the message this morning, uh, but she uh, is, is, is poorly after a second COVID, uh, COVID job. So, John and I spent some time, a uh, short time this morning, and I thought, okay, what are we going to say then? Because clearly, God, you have a message on your heart for us this morning that we were unaware of until the early hours of this morning. And um, what is exciting is we have just started last week a uh, new preaching theme, new preaching series around the statements, let us. Do you remember from last week? Not let us is, let us is. All right? And in the book of Hebrews, um, the writer uses uh, these two words, let us, multiple, multiple times. It's almost like, it's just like, just let us crack on, let us run towards God, let us find out who he is, let us discover all he has for us. And, um, and so we are going to be picking up the scriptures that this would have come around this morning, and uh, we're going to... Yeah, what we're going to say is that, that actually we, Lindsay sent us her preach notes about an hour ago, and it's just amazing. But we're not, we're not delivering Lindsay's message at all, we're going to get her back uh, to do that at some stage. Um, just before we, we crack right into the scripture, I'll just share with Pete, um, we, we realised about nine o'clock that Lindsay wasn't going to be able to make it. Um, and I actually went out and thought, well, I really want to water my plants just to get my head together. And I, I was just watching the containers this morning before the heat of the sun. And, and I really clearly felt God say, well, you're watering the plants to keep them alive, but today you've actually got to bring the living water. And, and I'm believing today that this was completely ordained to God. Uh, it's not about people themselves, it's not about how we deliver, but actually we're really urgent to see the truth, to get that living water from what we're wanting to share with you today. So shall we read the scriptures, please? Yeah, so I think I'll come on screen. This is Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, all the way to verse 16. So, so two versions, I'll do the NIV and then you do the message. Right. So here we go. So Hebrews 4, 12 to 16, in the NIV says this, For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are. Yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Fantastic. And then the message version is going to come up for us in a second. Well done, Stella. Nice. God means what he says, and what he says goes. His powerful word is as sharp as a surgeon's scalpel, cutting through everything, whether doubt or defence, laying us open to listen and obey. Nothing and no one is impervious to God's word. We can't get away from it, no matter what. Now that we know what we have, Jesus, this great high priest with ready access to God, let's not let, let us not slip through, uh, let us, better, let's not let it slip through our fingers. We don't have a priest who is out of touch with our reality. He's been through weakness and testing, experienced it all, all but sin. So let's walk right up to him and get what he's so ready to give. Take the mercy, accept the help. Stunning scriptures, aren't they, church? Stunning scriptures. So I said, perhaps if you go back to the NIV version and just put that on, we're actually just going to run through those six verses. We've got a little plan, which I've got written down here, uh, in case we forgot what we're going to do. We're almost going to take a verse at a time, alternately, yeah. uh, but not quite. So, uh, yeah, so we're starting with, the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any 
double-edged sword. That's right, that's right. So, um, when I was a kid, uh, my, my, my mum's dad, my granddad Harry, and my dad's dad, granddad George, they both, they, they never met before my mum and dad started going out. But what was amazing was, they both had single-bladed, uh, kind of, uh, uh, single-sided uh, swords, cavalry swords. My granddad Harry had found it in the ruins of Lee Castle when it was bulldozed just before the war. And sorry, during, uh, during the war, during the war. And, uh, and my granddad George had found it in an attic of a house that he was bulldozed as a builder somewhere over yonder. And I always used to find it fascinating, these swords, that they kind of had a straight edge, but they had one sharp edge. And I used to ask my dad about it all the time, and to be honest, me and Sam used to get the name out of the sword wise when the parents were out. Thankfully, there were no injuries. But it fascinated me that there was one flat edge and one sharp edge. And um, my dad taught me that, that the reason they were like that is because they were ceremonial. They were for show. They were about performance. Have you ever seen uh, somebody uh, kind of have a fencing match? You know, it's all very, you know, there's rules and regulations. You can only fight in a certain way, and the team has to touch certain places and all the rest of the score points. But the Word of God is sharper than any, how many edges? Double edged sword. Now, when we think of a double edged sword, the writer would have known what double edged swords looked like, because in the time that this was written, the Roman Empire were right throughout Europe and the known world, and their swords were double sided. They weren't for show. They weren't a performance. They were for warfare. And so you wouldn't take a performance sword into a mighty battle with your flimsy little blade. You'd go in with a double-edged sword so that you could slash and cut and hopefully survive and get through the battle. I find it fascinating that he says that the word of God is sharp on a double-edged sword. This book is not the performance. This word of God is not a show. This word of God is for warfare. The, the Word of God teaches us that we are in a battle that we cannot see. There are principalities, spiritual things that afflict us, tempt us, try and get us away from the call of God in our lives. This Word of God is a double-edged sword designed for battle. To not just help us to survive, but to thrive. I love that. The Word of God is double. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit. What's the writer saying? He's saying, when you encounter the Word of God, your soul is laid bare, John. Absolutely. Your soul is laid bare. And then we'll just on to the, the next verse. The Word of God does so many things. It certainly helps us uh, attack, but it also exposes. In the next verse, uh, Stella, it says this. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. And then it goes on to say this. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him. So the, the Word of God exposes us for exactly who we are. Right. And actually we can take fantastic confidence from this. Although, in one sense, it's a terrible thing to be exposed, to be, to be naked, to be laid open before God. But also it means that there's nothing we can do, there's nothing we need to hide from Him. We don't need to feel ashamed when we come into God's presence because of what Jesus did. And, and the, the Word of God exposes everything to God. And as we come into His presence, we can just lay ourselves open. We can come into God's presence and say, Lord, you know me better than I know myself. Yeah. You know the hair on my head. You know the thoughts I've ever thought. You know the things I've ever said. You know everything I've done. You know everywhere I've been. Right. And yet you still love me. I love how the, uh, the, the message version said that uh, used the idea of a surgeon's scalpel rather than a double edged sword. I mean, there's a bit of poetic license there in the message Bible. But I think that's interesting because a surgeon uh, isn't out to destroy our bodies. The surgeon is out to repair us. You with me this morning? So this, this double-edged sword, this word of God lays us open to heal us, to repair us, to pull us back together better than we were ever were in the first place. It's incredible. So that brings us to the first letters. Now, one of the reasons that, that we're concentrating on these two words, letters, is that the writers of Hebrews, we did mention this last week, but, but what they do is he comes out with a statement or a fact or a truth Something that's really important. And then he uses these words, letters. So we've actually looked at the fact that we've got the word of God. Uh, and, and that we know that it's a two-edged sword and we know that it exposes. And then he said, because of this, letters. So letters is all about applying the truth that God has revealed in a real way. So are you going to take the first Yeah, so we can have verse 14 up. And there it is. It says, therefore, 
So we just heard that the word of God is in and out, which sharpened the double-edged sword. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith that we profess. Incredible. So let's hold firmly. So can you tell us a bit about the high priest? Yeah, so if you've been in church for a long, long time, you've probably heard a million sermons on what it meant to be a high priest or the role of priests. If you're new to church, let me give you a bit of an explanation. So in the Old Testament, the old part of the Bible, the people of God, the Israelites, the Jewish people at that time, the only way that they could be rid of sin in their life was for a, a perfect, blameless animal, something like a pure white lamb or a pure white turtle dove, would be taken to the temple. So say Rachel and I, we lived our whole life the, the last year, and we've had our ups and downs, and we've had some great highs and great lows, and we've messed up a few times. So what we do is, we, we go to Jerusalem, and we, and we go and buy the, the best, uh, the most perfect animal that we can, and we take it to the priest there in the temple, and we say, look, we want to transfer our sin onto this animal, would you sacrifice this animal, and that sacrifice will act as the redemption of our sins. It was pretty brutal, wasn't it? Pretty brutal. But here what we have in Jesus is we now have a great high priest, a great high priest. We don't have to, as Christians, atone for our sins by, uh, by buying something like an animal and take it to a priest. Please don't bring your lambs and your doves to John and I because we ain't doing any kind of sacrifices here according to the Zor message to. The Word of God teaches us that Jesus himself became the atoning sacrifice, the once and for all sacrifice, all time sacrifice to redeem us from our sins. Now here is the role of the priest. Back in the day, the only person who could enter into the presence of God was the high priest. Once a year, they would enter behind the curtain, and behind that curtain would be known the, uh, as the Holy of Holies. The presence of God was manifest. The priest could only go there once a year. Only the priest. You people and people like me could never access the actual vibrant living presence of God. Only a priest once a year. But Jesus, because he was the Son of God, the blameless, the sinless, perfect sacrifice that hung on a cross to accept our sins, to rinse our souls clean of sin, he is the high priest. He, he, he sees God all the time. Now, this is what he says, the high priest who have ascended. What was the ascension? That was Jesus going back to heaven. Where is our high priest right now? Is he in a temple waiting for us to ask forgiveness? No. He's at the right hand of the Father in heaven. And he is accepting us every time we come to him. We don't have to wait once a year to get ourselves right with God. Every single moment of our lives can be a moment to get our hearts right with God. Because the great high priest is constantly in communion with the Father. Is that good? And so this morning, no matter what we've walked in with, therefore, since we have a great high priest who ascended, let us not move away from his faith. He says, let us hold firmly to our faith. Are there times in our lives where we have a faith, but it's not particularly held on to firmly? Have you ever experienced that? I think we all have, to be honest. But here the encouragement is, since we have this incredible Jesus, let's hold tight to who he is and what he is able to do for us because he loves us. Is that amazing? Yeah. And then the next verse, verse 15, links the two messages that we're looking at today. Because the writer then goes on to say, because we don't have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way. So it really links in with, with the second answer. But, but the, the writer there is saying, look, Jesus knew what it was to be human. He was completely God, but completely human at the same time. And he was tempted in the way that we were tempted. The only difference is he never gave into that temptation. But he knew what it was to have a, a hot sunny day, to be tired, to be thirsty. He knew what it was to have a, a workshop full of, of tools that he got to work in, what it was to, to, to labour and to toil to earn his living. He knew what it was to be walking on hot, dusty roads. He knew in particular what it was like to be tempted. The Bible tells us he was taken out for 40 days and yeah. specifically, directly targeted mm. by the devil himself yeah. and tempted in ways that perhaps none of us have ever really experienced. And he withstood that temptation. But it means that Jesus is there for us and we can enter 
that throne of grace because of all that Jesus did and because he knows, he knows, just as we were singing, he knows how every week is. He knew that we would fail. Yeah. It still came through grace yeah. and peace. That's and that grace and truth. That's, uh, that's wonderful. I mean that word in the forest. He's able to empathise. Thank goodness we have a saviour who is not unable to empathise with us. Have you ever tried to comfort somebody and you know you're faking it? Because the thing they're going through, you've never been through. So the very most you can do is sympathise at best. They've not ever been there. There's nothing wrong with comfort. But when you can empathise with somebody, when you've walked a mile in their shoes, you feel in your guts, don't you? We know that the Bible says that Jesus was full of compassion for people before he went. And, that, and, the, and the word in Greek for compassion, it means he felt it in his guts. In other words, the pain and the suffering that people went through turned in his stomach. Isn't that incredible? Yeah. It's Jesus. He's not unable to em- 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 empathise with our wings. He's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. I, I remember, actually, it's just been in my mind, but I remember uh, many years ago in this area, there was a there was a, a preacher called Paul Smith who was a minister in this area. Well, they're fashion designer. Uh, so, yeah, this is before the Love fashion designer, fashion. Paul Smith. And I remember him telling us once uh, that in his grandmother's house, uh, he was a Christian kid, there, there was a painting on the wall, the wall itself, of just an eye. And underneath were written the words, He knows. Uh, and his grandmother had that painted there because it was to show to her that he knows, and, and Paul Smith was a brilliant preacher, and he leant over the pulpit, and he said, but I want to tell you, if I painted that picture, I'd have painted a teardrop in the corner of the eye. And right. he's got one of those moments where, he, and he's because he knows, and because he knows, he empathises, mm. and he weeps when we weep. He rejoices when we rejoice, but he right. really does know. Let's just pause a second. Are you encouraged so far this morning? Yeah. Is this going well? Yeah. <laughs> well, I know. Alright then, we've got one more verse to share. Yeah, so can we go to verse 16? Uh, I, I love this verse, and there's three really simple parts to it which we're just going to quickly look at. So the writer finishes this section, he says, Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Can we just go back to the previous slide? That's great, thank you. So there's three aspects of this. Um, one of the other versions, which I actually prefer, actually uses the word boldly. A bit like Star Trek, kind of, we can boldly go. We can start no, our infinity no. if, if you want to speak your infinity, that's okay. But it actually says, let us boldly approach the throne of grace. You know, one of the, the main plans of the enemy is the enemy wants us to consider that Jesus is unapproachable. Yeah. He, wants us, he wants us to think that, that we're just so useless, so pathetic, that we're letting down so much, that actually we haven't got the right to approach Jesus, he to ask forgiveness. Right. And actually the writer here says, no, when you approach the throne of grace, because of what Jesus did, you can be bold about it. Yeah. Now bold does certainly not mean that we enter the throne of grace with a, a pride, or an attitude like that, or an arrogance, uh, or that we just do it in a casual manner. It doesn't mean that we should be uh, slipshod about things, but it does mean we can be bold. It means that we should constantly be coming to the throne throne of grace without any reservation. There's nothing we've done that stops us having boldness when we come before the throne of grace. We come freely. We don't need fancy words. We don't have to be eloquent. We don't have to to, to, to work at it in that way, we just come as we are, with a confidence, yeah. but also with a persistence. Jesus told a story once about a persistent widow that kept going back and asking for justice, and he tells us that we need to be persistent with God, that this is not something we do one-off, but we constantly need to be approaching God's throne of grace, opening ourselves up before him, saying we've left it down again, we've goofed again, something's gone wrong, but I'm still bold, I'm still confident, I'm going to come before the throne of grace. In the, the Old Testament times, the rabbis used to teach the, the, the people uh, about God. And they actually used to teach that God had two thrones. They used to teach that God had a throne of mercy 
and God had a throne of judgment. And, and the one thing that they couldn't do very well, because it was before Jesus' time, they couldn't reconcile the two very easily. But they did this teaching about God's throne of mercy and God's throne of, of uh, judgment. Because it's in God's nature to be merciful, but it's also in God's nature to be completely just. That's why the Bible says, and we've just been singing here, that Jesus came for truth and grace. Yeah. He wasn't, he didn't have a balance right between the two. He was completely full of grace. He was completely full of truth. And, and just bear that mind that God had these two thrones. But the writer now to the Hebrews said, actually in Jesus, those two thrones, the throne of mercy and the throne of judgment, are combined into the throne of grace. Wow. In Jesus, those wow. two thrones are combined and we come boldly before that throne of grace. And when we get there, what do we receive? Wow. We receive from God mercy and grace. That's what it's all about. There's a, a saying you've probably heard before, and as we were just chatting in the back, I said the thing, I'm going to use that expression. I don't even know who, who to accredit it to. But it's been described like this, that mercy is not getting what we deserve. But grace is getting what we don't deserve. Let me repeat that. Mercy is not getting what we deserve. It's not being treated the way that we deserve. That's the way God deals with us. Yeah. He doesn't punish us as we deserve. Yeah. Grace is getting what we don't deserve. Not only does God give us forgiveness, but he picks us up. So as we clear, so we're saying that because of the word of God that lays us bare and exposes to us how we fall short of what it takes to even get a ticket into heaven, yeah. purity from sin. Yeah. God, are you saying that mercy is something that we don't deserve in the natural? Yeah. And grace, the empowerment of God to live a godly life, yeah. is something that we could never battle. He gives us that. Yeah. He gives us That's mercy and that. grace. And then it just goes on to say, uh, in the last part of the verse, we receive mercy and grace to help us in our time of need. Just as you left that trip here, but just so I was thinking a bit more, there was just one more verse that came to me, which is Philippians 4, verse 6, which I have to look up because it's a I can't remember the actual place that I've put it. This verse, I thought we could pass it anyway, which actually says this Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer, let your requests be known to God. And I thought we should end this morning by doing that, by not being anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer, let our requests be known to God. So today we've very, in a slipshod manner, and we, we, we don't apologise for the way it's been done because there was no other alternative, but we've looked at these things. We've looked at, as Pete said, the fact that we, we can, the Word of God exposes us in our weakness, but we can still be bold to approach God's throne, that we will receive at the throne of grace both mercy and grace. And what we now can do is we can just approach Him. We're going to put into practice what the Word told us to do. That we're not going to be anxious, but we're just simply going to come with prayer and we're going to have a question before God. So we're going to have a time now, uh, and it's only 20 past 11, so I think we've done reasonably well. I'm going to pray also about timekeeping where. We're just going to pray. We're going to give you the opportunity to pray uh, you know, quietly, I would imagine, to yourself. But just enter into a time for the band are going to play that, that last song again. But this is a time where you can come before that throne of grace. Where you can actually come before God as you are, <coughs> naked, exposed, given confidence. So today, we want to just give you the opportunity to spend some time coming into God's presence. Mm. With your requests, it might be a request for forgiveness. It might be that you really feel that you've let God down badly this very week. It might be a request for, for healing. It might be a request for someone in your family. I don't know what the Lord needs of, but God does know. And God knew that this was going to happen today. And to just go back to that very beginning, that living water, the living water that you're being offered today. God is just saying, drink my living water today. Bring your requests. Trust me. You accept it as you are. Come boldly. Just approach me. Tell me what you want. And I will answer your prayers.
So can we just adopt an attitude of prayer uh, and um, just think on these words? Just think how amazing it is that we have a high priest who's been there and who's done everything for us. No matter how we let God down, He's there to forgive. It's in His very nature to be merciful. But He isn't just God, and we need to confess our sins. And if we do, He'll truly forgive us. Yeah. His presence is with us. Thank you. 